you have to go back all the way to the bubonic plague, which killed, what, 200 million? It killed over 50% of Europe. I make my shelters for an airborne pandemic that doesn't even exist at this time, and nuclear fallout second, and then civil war third. So what's the biggest bunker you've done, would you say? I want these bunkers to last your lifetime, your kid's lifetime, your grandkid's lifetime, until one of the generations is gonna need the bunker. Are the elites building bunkers right now? Are the elites are almost exclusively the ones building the bunkers because they can afford it. So this would be like basically a safe room where if you're, you were having a home invasion, your family could go down there, ride it out until the authorities came or till you could deal with the situation. That's exactly what it's designed yeah. for. So this isn't just for doomsday preparation. There's a lot of practical uses for this. What other natural disasters would your bunkers be able to? Well, it's what, it's what I call an all disaster shelter, whether it's a hurricane, a tornado, a home invasion, wildfires, um, a place to put your gun collection, a place to uh, have a wine cellar, whatever. But it's, it's basically the same shelter, but it just has different faces at different times. But in a flip of a switch, you can close that door and turn on the air system, and you have a certified nuclear fallout shelter. God forbid you ever need it, but who knows what the future will bring. So it's better, like I said, and like many people say, it's better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it. Plus, it's just pretty damn cool to have a secret bunker with a secret passage uh, below your house that nobody knows about. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you a funny story. It just came out on Fox News yesterday. They interviewed me. They're worried that this, this girl in, in the United States, that blonde girl, that uh, they found her body and they're looking for the boyfriend. They believe that he has a bunker, that the parents put a bunker underneath the house. So they've been interviewing me. They put out an article yesterday. It's like Atlas says, I get put it odds at about zero that if he has a bunker, they haven't found it yet because you got to have air pipes to go into a bunker. And the FBI would have enough sophisticated gear to try to figure out if there was a bunker there. So you uh, do a variety of different bunkers. You do custom jobs. What are the different types of bunkers that people can get, like ranging from the, the smallest to the most like fortified of, of fortresses, as you call them? Um, well, Atlas does every type of bunker that exists. We do poured in place concrete. We do round steel, which looks like a big giant gas tank. It's half inch thick steel. It's just a big giant tank. We do uh, the galvanized culvert, but that's, li that's limited to dry, arid places like California, New Mexico, Nevada, West Texas, Utah, Colorado. You, you can't dig down and hit a water table because the culvert is not uh, watertight. Now, you can control it with a sump pump, but you may have a $100,000 bunker and a $200 sump pump. If it wears out, it can maybe let water into the bunker. So we've done a lot of them, but we always let them know you better maintain that sump pump. But I do every type of shelter you can think of, round, square, um, monolithic domes, which are very cool. It looks like a big old igloo, but underground, but they got 20 foot ceilings inside. You can play basketball inside them. But I do every type of shelter that you can imagine. And then when I do them and the customer will let me, I'll video them. But not everybody will let me video their bunker. So what's the biggest bunker you've done, would you say? Right now, the biggest one, I'm, I'm doing one right now that's 9,200 square feet. That's big. That's big. But this is phase two of it. The first phase is 5,000 square feet, which is done, which never got videoed or filmed. Phase two is 4,200 square feet. And I will film that part being built, and I will film it in the factory, so I will put it on my YouTube channel. But it's up to the customer to let us film at the site or not. So a lot of them don't want that, and they'll have you sign a non-disclosure uh, before you do it. So a lot of, you, you get a lot of comments like this where people are saying, you know, uh, I could just break into that bunker. Me and my boys with our 50 cals could unload on that door, and we could be in there in five minutes. Can you tell people the difference between a bunker and a fortress? Well, a fortress is designed to be attacked, okay, and repel artillery and bullet fire. I mean, that means you, it's, it's, a, it's like a castle. I mean, that's a fortress. But there's no fortress and there's no bunker that can't be taken out by the right bomb, okay? The idea of a bunker is to keep it concealed to where people do not know that you have it. So in other words, while you're watching my left hand up here, my right hand is taking some of the food back here. Well, it's the same way with a bunker. 
You want to hide the bunker in plain sight, but you don't want anybody to know about it. So having a bunker is more secretive than your bank account. You got to tell your kids. You can't be telling Johnny and all the other kids that we have a bunker and it's so much fun. Come over and play in it because if we ever need this bunker, this is what's going to keep this family alive. And if they don't have one, they may try to kill daddy and take this bunker for their family. You know, they say what we're what nine miles away from anarchy. Just think what it's going to be like if missiles are in the air or there is an airborne pandemic like the world has never seen and people are just dying like. You know, you have to go back all the way to the bubonic plague, which killed, what, 200 million? It killed over 50% of Europe. We haven't seen nothing like that in a long time. But the bunkers I'm making are airtight. If you have to find an airtight chamber where you can't breathe the air, the bunkers I'm making at Atlas and is why they're selling so good. They're airtight, and I, I advertise that they're airtight. So if you go in the bunker, you will not be breathing the air outside. So if there is an airborne pandemic, which like I said, nothing exists that is lighter than air, but they're trying to develop it. But you have to, if you have to go into an airtight environment, the Atlas shelters are the only ones that I know of at this time without going into a medical grade tent that you could pop, but a hard structure, the Atlas shelters are the only ones that are out there. And so I make my shelters for an airborne pandemic that doesn't even exist at this time, and nuclear fallout second, and then civil war third, because that's the... Uh, Actually, I might swivel, switch to civil war with the, uh, with the nuclear fallout because that's the order in which I think things will happen. Well, there's a lot of, not like you say, knowledgeable people with skills who work on power lines and work on, you know, the grid. And so these guys aren't all just going to go away with their no. knowledge, you know. So what we would see, I would imagine, if we were in a Mad Max world, is we would see some sort of steampunk level of technology reemerge again where it's, not up to what we have right now, but it's kind of using remnants of the old world to piece together something which uh, obviously is not going to achieve the same level of technological uh, development we have. But yeah, it's not just going to be going back to horse and buggy is what I'm saying. No, but there, the people will be using the horse and buggy. There's a, there's a show out there that was created about 15 years ago. It's called uh, After Armageddon. Now, I actually posted that video on my website. And they took it down. But it's basically a story about everything's fine in America and a pandemic breaks out, kills off 95% of the people in America. So people get out of the big city because gangs have taken over the city and this man, his wife, and those two kids were not affected by the pandemic. They go out and they live in the wilderness and it becomes a barter system because money's no good, gold's no good. Is why I always say, I would rather have a thousand life straws and a thousand ounces of gold when that time comes because you can get, you can get uh, an ounce of gold with the life straw. So it's like, okay, keep your gold and die or get my life straw for $6 and, uh, and you can drink that water and not get sick. But um, I put value in survival supplies like what you have here uh, over gold and silver and, and it doesn't hurt to have it. But uh, I would much rather have the food supplies and things to barter with in the future than a bunch of gold that really, who, who's needing gold? Yeah, That's cool. just my thought. Yeah, it's good to diversify. We kind of advise people to diversify assets and not put all your eggs into any one basket. But, you know, when we're not preparing for total collapse, there still are some utilities for precious metals. But by and large, you know, I think a person's priority should be on the gear first yeah. and the food and the long-term food storage, which is not going to depreciate. It's only going to appreciate in value. Um, one other question I wanted to ask you, what makes your bunkers special? And like for a person who doesn't know anything about bunker building, why are your bunkers the best on the market? Well, the reason the Atlas bunkers are the best on the market, first of all, they're all made with gas type doors. Okay. I put a big emphasis on gas type, which means air type, because I don't want biological matters, radiation or anything getting into the bunker. So just to be clear, other bunker companies no not to name it. any nobody's there no they, they use normal doors they just have a metal door made of like a piece of quarter inch plate okay. okay it's just a metal thing my doors are gas tight so when you go in my bunkers you feel like you're in a submarine you're locking down these gas tight doors not only do i put one but in most of my premium bunkers you got to go through three plus a bulletproof hatch just to get to the living quarters right. that way you have a decontamination room so my shelters are made where they have a decontamination room that you can pressurize the decontamination room, 
like something out of a movie that you've seen in the military. So people coming in, we can pressurize it. They can disrobe, take a shower, then come into the bunker, and we don't allow any contaminants from the outside. The second reason why the Atlas bunkers are so good, I'm using the Swiss-made air filtration system. That's an NBC air filtration system. It stands for nuclear, biological, and chemical. But they're very quiet. They have a 25-year lifespan, and they have a lot of carbon. So my air filters will last through like four atomic explosions. Um, I don't know how they know that, but they basically, the company that makes them has been around so long that they've actually were able to test them. You understand when they were doing the test back in the 60s in the Nevada desert, you could test the bunkers, test the air systems, because it simultaneously they set off the bombs and you could test this stuff. So they did hundreds of tests just 45 miles from Las Vegas in the Nevada testing grounds. Mm. The life cycle of the air system is 25 years. Okay, so this is 2021, so we're talking 2046 before you would have to even exchange the air system, but the motor itself is gonna be good for 100 years. I'm burying them deep, six feet minimum, maxing out around 10 feet because you don't really need to go any deeper, even in Canada because the ground will freeze so deep. But when you get down below six feet of earth, the, the, the temperature stabilizes and it becomes like 56 to 58 degrees in the bunker, even in the middle of the winter, when it's 40 to below here in Canada, you go down the bunker, it'll be 56 degrees. So it's an excellent place to put your food preps that you want to preserve also. It's perfect because it's going to stay nice and cool. Uh, the next item that people love about the Atlas bunkers is they have a lot of storage. Tons of storage under the floor. The round shelters have three foot of storage. The square shelters have two foot of storage. So all these boxes that you have, you can fill the entire floor under the bunker and then keep the bunker nice and neat. Now, the other things that people like about my bunkers is the fact that I make them feel like a house. You have modern appliances, kitchens, bathrooms, toilets, everything you would find in your house, you would find in my bunker. So you don't feel like you've been locked into a jail cell. You feel like, oh, I'm just in a house underground. I got a couch, an entertainment center, Doors closed, you got, have privacy. I put master bedrooms in my bunkers, the larger ones. Um, the next item, I'm making them so strong on the outside. I'm using a wide flange structural I-beam. So after we build these things, we sandblast them and then we coat them with a 150 year tar coating. So when we bury them underground, they'll outlast the house. Um, other things we're using now, uh, the floors. The floors are made out of a composite decking. So they'll last forever. They won't mold, they won't rot. The walls are not made out of wood. They're actually made out of um, hardy board, which is concrete. So we've eliminated anything that will mold, rot, blah, 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 anything that can go bad. So two years ago, I was using a lot of wood. Now I'm not, okay? Because I want these bunkers to last your lifetime, your kid's lifetime, your grandkid's lifetime, until one of the generations is gonna need the bunker. But sometime in the future, a family is going to want a safe place to go because something is going on in this world. Let's, well, we have a bunker. We have a plan B. It just gives you, some, it gives you some calm. It makes you feel like, hey, we're protected. We have the insurance to protect our family. So the difference between a bunker that would last maybe 10 years before it started to rot or do something like that and investing that extra bit of money that it would cost to have it well done is really worth it because you're preparing not only for yourself but future generations. So it's like yeah. a family uh, <laughs> family heirloom, so to speak. Well, it's a hand-me-down. I mean, yeah. you, the people who are buying bunkers aren't necessarily buying them for themselves or buying them for their kids because they want to protect their family. So every mother has a mother bear inside her. Matter of fact, it's funny that more women buy bunkers than men. So about 54, 55% of my customers are women, about 45, 46% of the customers are men because they have that mother bear effect. They wanna protect their kids. Now, nowadays, it was funny, 10 years ago, when someone bought a bunker, the, the husband thought the wife was crazy or the wife thought the husband was crazy. <laughs> Nobody thinks no one's crazy anymore. I haven't seen that in like five years. I mean, they'll, oh, he's crazy. He's going to spend our money and put it in a hole in the ground. No, no. They come in together now and they equally believe in it. But bunkers are kind of like drawn on a political line. People to the right like bunkers. People to the left don't generally like doomsday bunkers. They like fire shelters. They like wine cellars. They like tornado shelters. People on the right like their doomsday bunkers and all the other types of bunkers too. But uh, I've noticed that. I'm not getting as many um, people who are less conservative buying the bunkers as people are more conservative.
So is there any other misconceptions you think people have about uh, bunker building in the industry before I let you go here? Because I know you got lots of stuff to do. But is there any final thoughts on, you know, where this is all going? Do you see business picking up in the future even more? Or has it kind of plateaued? Or No, I, I don't see it slowing down uh, in the future, which is sad. Uh, uh, bunker, the bunker business is like a spike when the the... When the attitude of the country is low, bunker business is at its highest. When it's at its highest, the bunker business is at its lowest. You know, it's kind of the counteract to a... It's like a barometer for yeah. what's going on. Well, it's a, when you think one stock's going to go up, the other one's going to go down. So right now, the bunker business stocks are through the roof because people in the world, in America especially, believe that the future for our country doesn't look very good. And uh, they're spending money on supplies, food, um, everything that Nate sells here at Canadian Prepper. I mean, this is what you need and, and then hope you never need it. But you know what, guys? The food, especially this mountain house right here, that stuff lasts for, it says 25 years, but I ate one that was 32 years old and it tasted like my mom cooked it. Yeah. That food will last forever, especially if it's in a number 10 can. But you can eat that stuff daily, I mean, just for snacks. So you can always eat your food, so you can't lose nothing by having supplies. That's how I look at it. Plus, it's fun to be a prepper. All right. Well, anyways, guys, if you have any more questions for Ron over at Atlas, go check out his channel, Atlas Survival Shelters, and feel free to leave your comments in the comment section below. You can get all your gear at CanadianPreparedness.com. And just want to thank you once again for coming out. And, Anytime, uh, buddy. Hopefully, we're going to do some, maybe some duck hunting later on in the month if I can <laughs> get a day to get out there. And if I can get back, we, we'll go duck hunting again. We, me and him hunted a few years back, and I showed him how to shoot a goose. So yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty good shot. But uh, I don't think my dog was a big fan because we had a few experiences. Well, where is your dog? He's just not here today. He's doing okay. well, though. Yeah. yeah, the German Shepherd, yeah. yeah. Good okay. old Marshall, yeah. I forgot about him. Yeah, he, he left you a present in your kitchen, and you weren't too impressed by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was it brown and smelly? Yeah. It yeah. Was. He was a pretty young pup at that time, yeah. yeah. But I think he's he's got his bowels a bit more worked <laughs> out. So, anyways, man, it's great seeing you again. So, uh, you take care, and we'll, we'll see you on the flip side. All right, guys, All thanks right. for watching. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. The best quality products at the best prices. Use discount code SURVIVALPREPPER, all caps, all one word, for 10% off. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.